I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents the H3O Art of Life show. Today our topic is, What Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Black Revisited? The title comes from a poem of that name by Dr. Margaret Burroughs, who was the founding, one of the founders of the DuSable Museum, as well as one of the founders of the Southside Community Arts Center. And I have with me my very able guest, Dr. Gaino Brooks, retired president of Malcolm X College, and Dr. Harold Pates, retired president of Kennedy King. Very happy to greet you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Same. Happy All to right. Be. Very good. It, yeah. You know, Harold and I go back a very long way because uh, we were almost classmates. That's but right. uh, he was in he was in the eighth grade and I was just starting. <laughs> 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 I just thought I would get that just break hey, the ice. So you so were in we kindergarten. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gano Brooks came into my life later. Or I came into his, whichever way it was. But before we start, I just want to set the tone by reading some lines from Doctor Doctor Burroughs' poem. What shall I tell my children? Which is just it just makes me, it just puts me in a frame of mind that enables me to discuss this topic. What shall I tell my children who are black of what it means to be a captive in this dark skin? What shall I tell my dear one, fruit of my womb, of how beautiful they are where everywhere they turn they are faced with abhorrence of everything that is black. What shall I tell my dear ones, raised in a white world, a place where white has been made to represent all that is good and pure and fine and decent? What can I do to give him strength that he may come through life's adversities as a whole human being unwarped and human in a world of biased laws and inhuman practices that he might survive and survive he must. He must survive for the good of all humanity. He must and will survive. I have drunk deeply of late from the fountain of my black culture sat at the knee of and learn from Mother Africa, discovered the truth of my heritage, heritage. The truths are often obscured and omitted, and I find I have much to say to my black children. I will lift up their heads in proud blackness with the story of their fathers and their fathers' fathers, and I shall take them into a way back time of kings and queens who ruled the Nile and measured the stars and discovered the laws of mathematics. I will tell them of a black people upon whose backs have been built the wealth of three continents. I will tell them this and more, and the knowledge of his heritage shall be his weapon and his armor. It will make him strong enough to win any battle he may face. I must sacrifice to find it for my children, even as I sacrifice to feed, clothe, and shelter them. So this I will do for them if I love them. None will do it for me. I must find the truth of heritage for myself and pass it on to them. And I'll stop there, and that's an abbreviation of a very long and very good poem. And I wanted to have this discussion because Dr. Burroughs 
had the foresight to raise the question, what shall I tell my children? We have children. Yeah. What are we telling them? Do we question what we are telling them or do we know what they are being told, some of which appears on the media? But we're not in the classroom, so that we don't always see what our children are being told by others, but what are we ourselves telling them? And I want to congratulate you, Gaynor Brooks, for having the Karnak Institute in Malcolm X College, because it was the Karnak Institute that reached out into the community and brought the community in to tell our children the truth of their heritage. Tell me how you were inspired with that. Well, the, I was inspired with the Karnak Institute from several people uh, directly, uh, Dr. Lennon Ingram for one, uh, and then from the community in general. I always thought that and I took to heart the role of the community college was to be about the community. It was supposed to be there to be a place where the community could go and utilize those physical, mental um, resources to improve itself. And so the Carnot Institute was an outreach of the college to come to the community and provide that vehicle for which the community college serves the community. So the students come in, and yes, they get programs, they get services, but they themselves are still a part of the larger community. And so the Carnac Institute was to be that vehicle to inspire, motivate, and improve the community. And therefore, to look at all of those social issues that the community faces, that our students face, that their families face, and address it. And so that's where we brought in the speakers from the community, the Dr. Masons, uh, the uh, Carl West, uh, Leonard Ingrams, yourself, all of these people who have had so many experiences in the community and in the world and could bring those to the larger community by sitting and talking with the students, their families, and the community who would come into the Karnak Institute. And it was done voluntarily. I mean, there were no, no uh, stipends, no honoraria, just the community dealing with itself through its own leadership, through its own griots. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's what we get when we get a leader with that kind of vision, that you see that represented and we saw that at Kennedy King College when you were president, Dr. Pate. Mm -hmm. Talk about your tenure and, you know, I can, Kennedy King College was almost a second home because that, you could find, you could meet everybody you knew if you just went there on a regular basis because everybody you knew would co be coming through there at one time or another. What attracted all those people to Kennedy King when you were president? Well, <clears throat> if you will recall, um, there was the indicia of Zehuti. Um, the the uh, ancient African icon of speech and wisdom. And one of the purposes of having that icon and making sure its presence was visible at Kennedy King was to remind our people that the greatest ancestral gift is their identity. And to begin to build upon that, uh, at the end of every graduation, I would always give a speech to remind our people that uh, they must visit and revisit the messages of the ancestors because inherent in those messages is the mission and vision of collegiality on the one hand, 
thought on the other and the ability to understand purpose. Now, when we understand that the ancestors have given the, us our identity, then we also understand the relationship between Africa and the color black. Um, <clears throat> the color black is inherent in the African appearance. And it is something that we not only should tell our children, but should rehearse them very well in the understanding that within this context is the reality of African black and the reality of European white. And once we understand that, we can begin to understand the meaning of the semantics of civilization. For an example, we are instructed, um, Carter Woodson told us uh, that there was such a phenomena as the miseducation of the Negro. Of course, there's no question about it, because when others have control of the education process, they also have control over the definition of what is to be studied and how you are to be labeled and what images um, uh, transmit authority. Now, when I was at Kennedy King, we tried to dig deeply into this well of thinking to understand what higher education might be. Because essentially, essentially, education is the reinforcement of the cultural values of the people. And if your institution is not doing that, then it is not educating the people. Now the training is another thing. So what we were doing at Kennedy King was, was addressing the need for remediation among our African American people so that they understood so that they would understand that there's some remedial work regarding how we get to where we are and how we must go to where we should go. And um, I was just reading, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I was reading some articles that were left uh, when my father died um, these articles address the problems of the Negro. Well, what is a Negro? What is a Negro? Who, who had the authority to characterize a population as Negro? Who had that authority? Well, <clears throat> back in 1927 in the 30s and so forth and so on, there were what we call schools for the colored. Now, who decided that Africans were colored? Who decided that they were Negroes? You see, all of these semantics are very, very important because they go to the essence of education. If as a result of being educated in an institution that does not have your best interest, you come out still with the feelings of inferiority, within yourself and superiority of those who assume the authority over you. Um, we tried to package this as theoretical approaches that would be at the foundation of every aspect of the curriculum at Kennedy King. Um, some of the teachers who were not prepared to engage this type of thinking um, found it uncomfortable because they had been well rehearsed um, they had been well rehearsed in 
higher education as is defined by a racist paradigm. And what we've got to do is understand very clearly the two realities. On the one hand, we're talking about African people who have African ancestors. And no matter where you go, you, the DNA does not change. I mean, if you have that much of it, I mean, your identity is the essence out of which you begin to, do, to achieve your purpose. It gives you a purpose. So then when we begin to talk about what do we tell our children who are black, the first thing that they must understand is that history did not begin with their birth. In fact, they are, they are a part of an infinite chain that goes all the way back to the beginning, if one can put one's finger on the beginning, as a matter of fact, so that once they understand that, they begin to understand also why education is a cultural is a, is a process of cultural reinforcement, and that they must fall within that chain so that they can perpetuate themselves and guarantee Africans' future, both in appearance and both in authority and both in cultural, um, uh, cultural stability. Certainly, certainly there are forces, <clears throat> there are opposing forces. I mean, certainly when you talk about op opposing for, uh, forces, we're talking about th those who would use education, uh, education to create of our people commodities so that they will forever be looking at, at Europe to define how they should act and how they should look and how they should pass the future to their children. Um, there is a lot about this that I think we not only should tell our children, but in the immediacy, in the immediacy of what's going on today, I think we have to also talk to our parents so that they will understand their responsibility uh, with regard to this. I'll say one more thing. <clears throat> Without being well rehearsed in what we're talking about now, without understanding very clearly that identity, our children will get lost in the obscurity of, of a racist, um, I won't call it a culture so much as it is a process that would continue to keep um, uh, continue to cre create war, war between one reality and another reality, and our children will not uh, even understand that they are at war, and uh, that our people are at war, and that the war is being imposed upon them by those who would wish to make commodities of them and to co keep the culture commodified so that in fact it can use the culture um, for new industries, particularly uh, if we look at what's happening today. And I'll just drop that uh, right now. Well, you know what, I, I didn't interrupt you deliberately because you were on a roll. <laughs> And it was a joy, wasn't it, Gaino? Yes, it was. To Absolutely. listen to, to, you were blowing like Coltrane. <laughs> well, and I just didn't want to interrupt you. And I have mm -hmm. a million questions and comments. I'm not doing it because I'm letting Gaino come in mm -hmm. with his horn. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, let's say a horn that we all must blow. Because th this topic, I think uh, Brother Pace hit it really the nail on the head. Uh, one, we've got to talk to our children about identity, who they are. 
And that, that is a magic question in this day and age. Who are these kids who we see with these cell phones, who we see on the, on the internet, who we see with their pants sagging, who we see doing research in labs, who we see in STEM prep programs all around mm -hmm. the country, who are making us a very proud people. But because the system, the racist system that Brother Pace points out to us, doesn't let us see that. It doesn't let us see the good in our youth. So we have to tell them who they are. I think one of the problems that has occurred, a Karnak is not there. Many of the HBCUs are not there as we once knew them and of the standards that we once knew them and the Little Red Schoolhouse standard that we once knew as a people where we went and became doctors, lawyers, scientists, and all of that. Those things have been lost to a degree because we are not telling our youth, our children, who they are. That has been lost. I think it's one of the key pieces that has been lost. And I don't know. I tend to blame it on ourselves. Did we get lazy? Did we get complacent? that we just hope and pray that somebody else would tell them who they are. Because we all know, once they know, once we know who we are, we're going to be great. We're going to do great. So I think we have to revisit in the sense that we did stop, we need to start, and we need to go hard. We need to go hard at our youth, our young people, we, the elders, we need to come hard at them because we don't want to, we can't lose this like we've lost this previous generation. I wanted to, you know, semantics. I, I, I wanted to just step right in here and say a couple of things on that, in that vein. And that is that I think Carter Woodson mistitled his book. He did what? I think he mistitled his book because it's called The Miseducation. Mm -hmm. And I call it The Missed Education, mm -hmm. M-I-S-S-E-D. Mm -hmm. And that is because education, the root of that word, as you know, comes from educere, which means to draw forth from within, to draw forth. If you are in an institution where all that is being done is you're being inundated with things that are not only coming from outside, but they are coming from somewhere, some geography that is not on your cultural map. In other words, when you're inundated with European values, philosophy, ideas, mm -hmm. and I don't call it culture, when you are in mm -hmm. inundated with that, you're not being educated. That is not education. Right. So right. you can't talk about a bad education. Either you are educated or you are not educated. If you are not educated, then something else is going on. So, you know, you could call it brainwashing. You can call it training. You can call it schooling. You can call it anything else. But when you wind up with strangers living in your home, then you know that they have been led away from themselves and oh, not toward Africa, but toward a foreign place where they are learning foreign ideas, not only learning them, but they're internalizing these ideas and these, are in, these ideas are now driving their behavior, driving their thinking, driving their conduct. So, I, I wanted to say that, but I think you hit it dead on because I think people take for granted that they know who they are, you know, yes. and you know thyself, mm -hmm. you know, okay. on the walls of the pyramids, know thyself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you don't know thyself, there, much, there isn't much else that will be of any value to you. Mm -hmm. If all you know is about someone else's culture, someone else's biology, geography, physiology, uh, someone else's philosophy, somebody yeah. else. 
the, the saddest thing of all is that we are imitating people who are imitating us. All of these gifts that we have given, all of the sciences, all of the things that have, have value, all of the things that you call culture that we have given has been stolen, recycled, repackaged, <laughs> first of all, misunderstood. Here is somebody who does not understand what he is stealing and steals this and then begins to, beautiful language, Dr. Pates, commodify it. Take things that we found, we held sacred and commodify it. Turn it into goods for sale. That's right. Turn it into products for profit at the expense of the human spirit and the human being. So the, the things that we have to be really concerned about are these things about identity, making certain that our children not only know who they are, but they are proud of who they are. And they wouldn't be anybody else if they could be anybody else. Yes, so right. <laughs> Let me just jump in there, Dr. Pace, on, on this point that you're on. And I want to say that we as a people, again, this question of identity is important because identity leads on to other things, other sociology, other philosophy. And if we look at the cultural context of it, we'll say that once you come to understand who you are, then you know that your philosophy has to be a different kind of philosophy. And so where America, Europeans look at people as a means to an end, the capitalist system looks as pe to people as a means to an end, we'll look at someone like Secretary Ture who will say that people are an end in themselves. So this point that we're trying to address in this short amount of time is just the beginning of the conversation that our young people need to get, engage in. And they can do it if we lead them that way, if the institutions that they are around, that they are a part of, will have those discussions for them. Our youth are our future. And so we've got to get them on that path. Well, let's take a look at something. Um, one thing that I think is very, very important are certain strategies by which our children are socialized. Let's take a look at the images of authority in the African community. And let's go globally with this. Let's go globally because when we talk about education as against training, when we talk about education and what we must tell our children, how is it that people who have been here since 1619 have before them images of authority that don't look like them. But yet they've been here longer than, they, they were here when the first boat came here. And there's never really been an open immigration of African people, I mean, essentially, into I America. I have to get an understanding here. Who's been here since 1619? We have, isn't it, isn't it understand? Wait. Maybe even, maybe even longer than that, because it's my understanding in the 1400s, the Portuguese, the Portuguese Pope started the first industry of selling African people. And that was in Portugal. Well, let, 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 let's, let, me, add, of, mm -hmm. let me add my understanding. John Jackson wrote a book called Man, God, and Civilization yes, in which he talked correct. about ancient yeah. America. And Lerone Bennett wrote uh, before the Mayflower. The, uh, before the Mayflower, and then we had they came, they came before Columbus, right. and we got right. all these people. That's right. Okay, the thing is that Africans came to this place, which was not called America. Of course, right. came to this place on their own. Some stayed, others went home. Some came and traded and went back home. Some came and married 
and and lived with the indigenous people who mm -hmm. you know mistakenly called Indians and then you get mistakenly called uh, Turtle, Isle, Turtle Island was yes. called America and all of that. But the thing is, Africans were already, we were already here. That is why we could run away. And why would you run off a plantation into you don't know where you're going? Mm -hmm. We knew where we were going because we had been here mm -hmm. before. So we didn't come in 1619 on those cargo ships. Right. We were already here. And the point that you're making, though, because that, that one is a technicality, the point that you're making, how is it that people who have been on the planet from day one, which you said, it, is, if mm -hmm. you could go back if you to could the go beginning, back to day one. <laughs> how is it that people who have been on the planet from day one are now looking at authority figures or ancestors or whatever you want to call them who are not like them? How do how do you get people to accept that? Now, I step step back and go. Well, ahead. that's one of the that's one of the problems with so-called the semantics of education. That's why I wish, in a way, that we would drop that term because our regular people um, don't really understand what that term means. Um, when you when you have a process of socialization mm -hmm. that that de-ancestralizes your people, Good. you see, once now we are taught, well, I guess we were, the fathers of the nation were George Washington, Thomas Alexander Jefferson. Hamilton, Ben Franklin, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et right. Now, when you talk about father, it seems to me that represents an ancestor, a semantic ancestral uh, category. Right. And uh, I don't see ancestors in the founding fathers. And it's very important to understand how this process of education continues to de-ancestralize our people. Now that that's critical with respect to keeping people oppressed. Once you identify with the oppressor, and because you see the racial orientation of Western culture, uh, its formula, its formula for existence is based on white supremacy, white superiority, and black inferiority. That's why you keep white authority in front of African people all over the world. If, a, as I look at the, at the teaching population, you know, they, they um, got these charter schools now. I say that they are, I, I draw upon the semantics of um, my father's generation. I said that these are schools for the colored. You know, these charter schools are really schools for the colored because uh, what they're doing is eliminating even the possibility of African teachers, uh, African authoritative teachers standing before African American students because they certainly don't stand before the European students uh, because they have they have sort of categorized themselves into uh, interesting religious schools. Like, I mean, charter schools have been around a long time. If Jewish people th say that they are white, of course you've got Jewish schools. If, um, if Catholics say that they are white, you've got Catholic schools. I mean, these have been charter schools. But if Africans say that they are African, then these other authorities give us the schools for the colored. Uh, they call us minorities. Uh, we need federal subsidization for a minority population. Well, I'm trying to find the land from which the minorities come. What is a minority? How can, you know, 
So when I say to be de-ancestralized means that categories of socialization come into being that would complement oppressive forces, that would commodify our people. If you're going to, <coughs> if you're going to give funds to African people, you have to call them minorities because the European can't deal with the reality of the difference in realities between African people and European people. White people, uh, black people, and white people. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, when we go back and look at their socialization, particularly when you come out of, of various scriptures, you will find that the color black is anathema. It is anathema. And that they are being socialized into um, a sort of feeling of superiority because I, this comes out of their religious books that somehow or another um, um, Noah. The Hamitic myth. Yes, the, you know, they <laughs> have, well, we can call it a myth except but it begins to achieve certain political realities within a culture that relies upon it also uh, relies upon these books to create to socially engineer our people. So then you say, America has a problem. One of its problems is the race problem. Well, when you say that, what is that the code for? Well, white people have to say, what do we do with Negroes? And there is an abundance of material addressing this question. What do they do with Negroes? Now, uh, on the flip side of that, as we are talking to our children, we must understand, we must propound and, and continue to remind them in a multiplicity of ways, we are not our enemy. If we have an enemy, it is not we. If we have an enemy, and I'm sure we do because um, um, you just don't impose war upon a people with guns. The most effective way is to capture their minds. The effective way. Yes, and once you capture the mind, <laughs> as, as one of our noted uh, psychologists, Dr. Barbie Wright said, once you capture the mind, you have the behind. <laughs> and, um, uh, that is, in fact, uh, the case. Because once you put the images, if the images of authority in the African-American community amongst the children, the teacher still has this in a way. The teacher is still looked upon to answer questions that children would raise. One of those questions might be, who am I? I would like to know how a white teacher can, can advise a young African-American, male or female, when he raises that question. I gotta, I, I gotta do this because this is killing me. Not because <laughs> I'm not interested in what you're saying, but because you just gave us, you gave us a word for part of the process of what has happened to us. You know, Hunter Adams is Absolutely. writing a book and he's, he's giving us a word. Right. He's, he's nailing it because right. see, the more precise we can be That's what we must do. about what this process contains mm -hmm. that has gotten us to the point at which we are in this condition, once we, under, once we get language to describe the experience, then mm -hmm. we know what it is, mm -hmm. and we can deal with it. Mm -hmm. When you said de-ancestral lies, I thought I would leap <laughs> out of this chair, because that's what 1619 does for you. Right. It has some grown people walking down the plank of a cargo ship in chains. Where did these adults come from? Were they born on this cargo ship? Did they, where, did they come from some other place, some other land? Did they have a family there? Did they have a mother and a father? 
grandmother, grandfather, great-grandmother, how far back do their generations go? So the fact that we have been cut off, not just from our land and language and culture and kinship group, but our ancestry. Absolutely. Those who our community is made up of the living, the dead, and the unborn. Absolutely. We, what is our relationship to those who are our ancestors, who have passed? Yeah. We don't know who they are. Mm. We don't know because our beginning does not begin at our beginning. Yes, our absolutely. beginning is designated. They picked out a date and said, this is the day mm -hmm. you came into being. Yes. Like Topsy, mm -hmm. you just grew. You came into being on this day and you didn't have a name, so we named you Toby. That's and right. if you didn't accept Toby as your name, That's then right. we cut off your foot. That's right. That's right. So that you would accept, you don't, we'd impose this authority violently by force so that you would understand who was in charge here. And that is what has been the process. The, that de-ancestralization just, just nails it. Mm -hmm. And we need that. You know, cool. whatever else happens, if we don't go, if I brought with me an obituary. In fact, I have more than one. Mm -hmm. Not because I want to talk about this young man who died at the age of 32 from mm -hmm. ALS. From what? From ALS, Lou Gehrig's mm -hmm. disease. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wanted to say mm -hmm. is that our relationship to our ancestors is not what it should be. If you pass a cemetery in a community that is non-black, you will see monuments and you will see people and you will see decorations. If you pass by cemeteries or go into them, as I do, you will find fewer monuments, you will find fewer decorations, and you will find fewer people. Somehow we think that when we take our people to these places and dump them, that they have, they have somehow left us. They are gone, you know, they, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord, and not no longer present with us in some form. So our relationship to our ancestors is very poor. We have no interest in our ancestors. We don't bring up their names in our conversations and in our family gatherings. Our children cannot go beyond perhaps a great grandfather if they can go that far. They cannot go through their family tree because we are not sitting our children down and we are not going through these he leaves to mourn. Mm -hmm. We're not saying this is your cousin so-and-so who is the child of this, this aunt and this uncle. What I'm saying is we have to re-ancestralize mm -hmm. Pates We've got to give our children a family that's larger than the nuclear family that we're emulating. Would you agree? Oh, 100%. Um, I'm saying that everything that we have been educated into in terms of European literacy has to be re-examined because uh, Sister Arne, for an example, tosses out the word ma'afa to characterize the process by which um, um, the slaughtering and, and atrocious uh, process of creating slaves. Now remember, I mean, slaves were not taken out of Africa. People were Absolutely. taken out of Africa. Absolutely, thank you, yeah. give me five. Yeah, <laughs> people were taken out of, of Africa. Europeans had slave factories where they, <clears throat> where they had corporate people like who were in charge of transforming, transforming a human being into a thing. Now our children need to understand the difference between say slavery in Greece and chattel slavery in Western 
um, civilization, they need to understand that to take a human being and make of him an animal and then sell him on the auction block on the auction block and to create a governmental process by which not only will he be a slave but his children in perpetuity will be slaves for as long as that generation as, as long as those people exist now it's important to understand the difference between a slave and a chattel uh, this is a chattel um, a cow is a chattel a horse is a chattel I was just reading some of that stuff about Stanley and Livingston as they were going into Africa and it's beautiful language that they used because they said they were they were at certain points confronted by the savages you know this is an interesting term used to describe people uh, people I've always I've always said that Europe has an it has an interesting literature of civilization but has if you look at behavior there's no characteristic behavior that shows civilized behavior because their history is characterized by processes of slaughtering people conquering land and using the land and the people uh, in the ways by which they industrialize the people I think that um, you see once we look deeply into who we are we come to the conclusion that we are different we are different we must tell our children that we are different and that requires of them different ways by which to think of themselves and others but you can't do that unless you are aware of others and aware of yourself this is why I say and why you're saying the ancestors are so important there's nothing like a 16 year older that feels that history began when he was born you know so he comes up and he says well mama I mean after all uh, that's not the way things are supposed to happen because this is a new day he must be informed as our culture if it were were not invaded upon we would probably be able to tell uh, our young young persons hush a minute don't assert yourself as though you know more than the elders what you must do is understand that this is a process of life and existence and the only way to go into the future is to have a thorough understanding of the past so then if you are not a part of the past you must make yourself aware of what happened in the past and the principles of the past that ground that should ground your values and you spoke of values which I think are very, very important because one of the values that I think um, is so important is to recognize the importance uh, the, uh, the 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 importance of of the ancestor as not only a part of your physical being but your spiritual being and there's just one other point that I think is so very very important one of the reasons for which God was given concrete personality was to make sure that we as African people knelt before the image of a white God 
once you do that, then you have lost the essence of, 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 of that ingredient in you that, that makes it possible for you to create. Because <clears throat> creativity is an expression of God's gift. And whatever you, what, whatever you create is not really what you have created. It is the result of all of that that has been put into you that makes it possible for you to create. That's why when we stand before, you know, people call many of our images and whatnot and our sounds art, yes, of course, because it comes through us to the next generation. It is not something that some individual possesses. It is a gift that has been given to him that makes, that creates his spirit and makes it possible for him to express it in such a way that a person says, wow, because I have, and I'll just say this, I have frequently wondered how the Pharaohs, uh, uh, um, how the Pharaohs, and not only the Pharaohs, the African kings and queens uh, created an industry out of making sure that the pharaoh was buried properly. But on the flip side of that, how strong was that spirituality that made it possible for them to take the crude utensils that they had and make monuments that puzzled the minds of people who presume to be experts in understanding technology. The African has been so powerful in his spirituality that once you break into that, once you break into that and impose upon him another kind of religion, what you tend to do is diminish his creative capability. You just going you just going you just going <laughs> try to just touch on all the things that are are <laughs> just so essential. You know, I mean, you are <clears throat> I, you know, the big mistake Gaino yes. was to have the two of you <laughs> together. Cuz go ahead, I'm a, I'm not going to say nothing. Go ahead, Gaino. No, I you know Pace is, is uh, setting the table for us. He's setting the table for us. Who's setting it? Dr. Pates. Oh, okay. Dr. Pates is setting the table for us. Okay. In terms of... Five minutes. How do we revisit? Okay, how do we revisit? What do we tell our children? And so we see that it's not any one thing but we see that it emanates out of our history, and our history is our culture. Our culture produces this history. And we know it is, was stunted, the growth was stunted at the point of, of slavery being imposed on us, and the direction that we were going as a people therefore got sidetracked. And now we're steering this car that has a bad alignment and we're trying to steer it back onto the road, back onto the track. In the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're we fighting. We need it. to make a U-turn. Oh, yes. Yes, because we, we missed our exit. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we missed our exit. So now we've got you, one of the few, who are trying to get us back on track because the institutions that we once controlled to some degree, to a small degree, are not there. And so how do we reach our people to tell them? Because as we said earlier in our off-bar conversation, I mean, we're in a war. We're fighting against people, system that has control of the media, that has control of the communication, that has com control of the education, the knowledge that we're getting. So how do we get control of it? Well, my next show, believe it or not, is called From 
public schooling to community education because that's where we need to go. Yes. We have to, it's a do it ourselves project. Dr. Burroughs said, I must, none will do this for me. Pluralize it. None will do this for us. If we want to tell our children the things that they need to know in order that they survive and develop, because we don't want them just surviving at the level of cockroaches. We want them That's to right. survive and develop. If we want to do that, it's a do-it-ourselves project, which means that homes have to become centers of education. I don't know, you said some stuff about organized religion. I don't know how much we can rely upon our churches. But we do have some forward-looking people in the clergy who do some wonderful things. They do address topics having to do with our history and culture. And so those things ought to be encouraged and they ought to be, be proliferated. But everywhere our children gather must be a place where they yes. are learning something about their identity, about their ancestry, about their spirituality, because in their spirituality is their power for everything. As you it's said, create, but it is their power to be yes. who they are, and therefore true. to express who they are in all these ways. I just want to tell you this, that on September the 6th, a young artist, a sculptor, Deborah Han, has been commissioned to create a monument of Paul Ernst Dunbar. A bronze monument is going up in Dunbar Park mm -hmm. and it will be unveiled. And this is a young black self-taught wow. female artist who has done this. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, on the <laughs> we got one, one time I um, I see out of the complete works of uh, Paul R. Steinbaum, I opened the book at my dining room table and set my teenage daughter and son down. And I said, I want you to read that. I said, okay, daddy, I can't read that. What kind of words are these? I said, now I'm going to read it for you and see whether you understood. He says, but that's not the way the words are spelled. I said, you see, <clears throat> Uh, Paul Ernst Dunbar done, did an excellent job of trying to use the alphabet to express the sound of the language that our ancestors used. And we're out of time. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wish, you know, this is... <laughs> <sighs> This has been exhilarating, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And I know we could, we could hang oh, yes. tough. Oh yes. We mm -hmm. could do some more of this. That's right. But unfortunately, we can't do some more of this this time. Can I see y'all? The motor is the message. I call for you. Share one mind